and shall be deep with someone nice as you. D is for everybody, darling. Have no doubt that you know. Again, just fascinating. Like human beings are, are fucking crazy. Uh, and, and I think that maybe that'll be a theme of the conversation we have today. (laughs) Do you think? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, here's the thing I, I really came away from, uh, in both reading road to Jonestown and, and watching less so watching the sacrament more, more of the book, um, is that I was, I, I grew in my appreciation for what people's temple was, before the drugs Mm -hmm. you know like to me that's the dividing line like you know he like jim jones was always an egomaniac but the drugs really seems to be the point where shit got bad yeah yeah Uh, (laughs) there was you know like the stories of hey we're gonna you know uh we're gonna refer you to the people's temple because you you need somebody to help you with paperwork for the gas and water department or something and they have people that will just help you do this and make sure your water doesn't get turned off and make sure that you're okay and you're safe and all that stuff uh you know before it was a cult you know but it was like a an organization that truly did good things well yeah i have a lot to say i have a lot to say on that so do we want to go ahead and get into it yeah sorry that's okay. Well, if you haven't guessed already, this is the VD clinic. Um, and it is March, so it must be March Madness. <laughs> Woo-hoo. Woo. Yeah. Or I don't know what's more appropriate. Well, that's true. And with me as always is Darren. I'm Vanessa, by the way. Yeah, with me as always is Darren. Yes, uh, if we do this a few more years, we'll be able to actually do a bracket with the people that we've covered. (laughs) And, you know, who has always joined us for this is um, uh, Mr. Bo Ransdale. Hello, hello. Uh, Or should we say father? Father. (laughs) In the Legion podcast universe. (laughs) I came to Uh, Legion with dad. Um, Yeah. (laughs) You know, it, it... it's just a, a what we call them. It's not a big deal. <laughs> uh, it's just you know, it's just a thing. It's just a nutty thing. Um, yeah, it, I look. I look forward to uh, coming on this show once a year to foul up the airwaves with serial killer and mass murder talk, and uh, we always seem to find good stuff to talk about. And this has been, I think the most like rewarding research for a show that I've done in some time, because I really, I I know you sort of implied Vanessa that your feelings are very strong about the early days of the, of people's temple. Um, But I thought it was really fascinating to kind of get it from the point of view of like, how do you get seduced into this? How do you turn idealism and the, the desire to truly do good work into something that is horrible and nightmarish and awful. And exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like that part of it is the thing that, that is, you know, for, it, it's frustration I have with the movie. I think is the, you just, it's so difficult to capture the scale of, of Jonestown and the, the scale of the death there. And also the, <laughs> the manipulation that got people to that point, you know, the, 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 the true cult behavior, like Jim Jones groomed an entire small town of people. It's stunning. You know, I mean, it helps when you just get them far away from everything they know and love and put them in the middle of the jungle where everything sucks. (laughs) Well, well, yeah, I mean, that definitely makes makes a difference. But before we get to um, that piece, yeah, dear listeners, we are talking about Jonestown this year and Jim Jones instead of 
a traditional uh, serial killer, which, you know, so many people refer to this as a mass suicide. And I do want to talk about that as part of our discussion day. But this is so much more of a mass murder. It, Absolutely. It yeah, really. Yeah. And I think that is part of what has come to light in more recent years is that people are starting to look at this more as a an actual mass murder uh, rather than just, oh, no, you know, it's all the, the, the joke of drink the Kool-Aid, you know, and it's this big mass suicide and where all these mindless zombies, you know, killed themselves. Well, no, there was so much more than that. Yeah, this uh, truly this is the story of the frog in in the boiling water, right? It is the slow inching up of the crazy until you look around and you're like, oh, this is nowhere near where we started. And and it has become, you know, again, it becomes deadly. And yeah, it, it absolutely it is. It is 100 um, percent like uh, the, the the tale of someone who manipulated these people never would have died were it not for Jim Jones. So I, yeah, I think it's definitely murder. No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I'm going to bring up some conspiracy theories as part of our discussion that, that we're not necessarily in the book. Okay. Um, cause sure you know, we I all did a little bit of outside, the curriculum looking at bits and bobs here and there. Yeah. the And the book that we, we read was road to Jonestown, Jim Jones and people's temple by Jeff Gwynn. And the movie that we're covering is Ty West, the sacrament, which not exactly Jonestown, but pretty damn close and clearly supposed to be, you know, modeled on it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I mean, it's very close. Uh, yeah, you're but no, like these. These came from New York, not California. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know that one of the problems I think with the movie when it first came out was that sort of you know Star Trek two sort of like, hey, mm -hmm. this isn't con. No, no, this isn't about Jonestown. This is this this is a different thing. It's like motherfucker, this is Jonestown. Down to, like, we've got the pavilion and the old guy sitting down addressing the family and even the way, you know, in theory, the way that he went out, we're not entirely sure uh, exactly how Jim Jones uh, went out ultimately. I mean, we know it was a bullet to the head, but, you know, did he do it? Did somebody else do it? That kind of thing. Lots yeah. Of ways that could have got there. Right. Right. They call him father. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> they, they call the thing the pavilion where they go do their late night talking sessions. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and time. there is and there is a lot of the language in the speech that is similar to some of the um, final tapes from Jonestown. Yes. Melty John Goodman guy uh, <laughs> said mothers help your children specifically mm -hmm. mm. there's uh, some of the there's some of the wording that you're just like if it's not exact it is so close that you're like might as well be exact well and you get some of the uh not not just the 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 language of you know mothers and fathers and stuff but some you know like help the, the children hurry hurry faster you know that stuff that uh, if you've listened to the Jonestown tapes, which you uh, listeners should never do, and also they are incredibly <laughs> fascinating. They are um, so amazing, but oh my god, are they haunting? It, yeah, it's like it—it it is not something that you will quickly forget. No, um, but it is—it tr it truly is like you know hearing some of because they you know one of the things was they recorded a lot of of Jim Jones. He would just get on the PA and just kind of, you know, freestyle it about whatever topic. Uh, and, but even, and, but I think really before we get to Jonestown, yeah, yeah, we yeah, need to talk about where Jim Jones came from and how People's Temple kind of grew. 
because mm-hmm. that is an important part of this conversation. Um, to get the full picture of just the snowball of kind of what happened. Yeah. You know, in the in the movie, the sacrament, they're only showing the final day, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, the last two days. <laughs> right, the last two days. So you're not so it's, you know, it's just basically this small series of events. But in it redu- and that's why I'm like the first time I watched the movie, I was kind of like, nah. it was I we had a much more lukewarm reaction. But this second watch for the show, I I did have a greater appreciation of it. Because I appreciated what they were trying to do, but I just, what I wish, why I think I'm left dissatisfied with it is because you don't have more of the background. I Yes, I totally agree with all of that. I The, the biggest failing of the movie, um, aside from just some bad marketing <laughs> before you ever saw the thing, um, is is that. It's, it's that you don't have an appreciation for how horrifying it is. Like when you see mothers feeding you know this cyanide concoction to their kids it that's terrible but in the scope of the actual story of people's temple it's way more horrifying because they were they willingly did it it was like you see that progression and and yes and no i'm gonna get into some forensics i'm gonna get into some forensics about and that's partly gets into gets into some of my discussion about conspiracy theories. Oh, okay. All right. Because there are differing we've got some differing forensic information between what the Guyanese government are reported and what the US government put in their official report. And a lot of it's steeped in colonialism. The differences, I think. But it's also, not to sound like Jim Jones himself, but it was a well-known fact that the CIA was watching Jim Jones and People's Temple. Well, yeah. It was been... not a secret. Okay, yeah. so that is a factor here, but there was also some other stuff going on with the... U.S. State Department and the CIA and Guyana at the time that I, I, I'm, they're just missing pieces of reports. And this goes, this is going to go, this goes into why I'm saying why it, we're, it's seeming more like it's mass murder is a more accurate term. There were so many people who had the cyanide injected into them. Right. Like in places they could not reach. So that is, they did, that's not suicide. That is obvious murder. And a lot of that, and that was some done with children. And there were a lot of, and it was, you know, you also had armed guards there and who were threatening to shoot you. Some people did get shot. Oh, for sure. I aren't the numbers and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the numbers were like, you know, up to like three or 400 of them as best as they could tell were, were shot or forcibly injected. Uh, Like a a little more than a third, Uh, like about two thirds went again by the stuff that I saw about two thirds went as, as part of the cause, as part of the revolution or seemingly seemingly. Yes. And then, a and then a little more than a third were like, fuck this shit. But you know, it was, mm-hmm. you, you were getting on that train, whether you wanted to or not. Yeah, no, it was, it was like one third to, uh, you know, a half or somewhere in yeah. there that, you know, were basically, it, there were signs that no, they were just murdered. Yeah. Like yeah, clearly yeah. murdered. And, but like I said, let's go back to the pre final days. Cause I, I do it's Jim Jones, you know, comes out of the Midwest. He comes out of Indianapolis. The, uh, with, with a crazy mother worth pointing out. His mother was batshit. Yeah. 
yeah yeah and he got just fascinated with religion and at a very early age and yeah. grasped you know he went religion shopping basically to figure out what style he liked the best and um even though they they were you know it, it, he sees more onto these kind of faith healer and like Pentecostal evangelical stylings, but he was, you know, technically Methodist. <laughs> Cause he made friends with that, uh, Myrtle Kennedy lady, right? That was who kind of, she was Nazarene. Yeah. Was that Indianapolis or Indiana still? Yeah, I think so. And then by the time he go, he goes to, um, California and the Bay area, mm-hmm meets you know rosalind carter and like they were you know more uh i forget it was the it was the methodist that he ended up pitching his uh it, it was or yeah. hitching his wagon to for a while because they were the least fire and brimstone and more right. the, like the whole deal that that jim jones uh preached uh, was it, one racial equality that was the the big message f- from early on. Yes, and and seemed genuine, or at least it was. <laughs> it, it, if the original impulse was not to genuinely do good, it was that Jim Jones saw an opportunity to make a name for himself doing good on this issue. And I'm not sure which it is because I think Jim Jones always wanted to be an important person. Uh, well, uh, without a doubt, he was, without a doubt, he wanted always to be an important person. And I think, I, I don't know, I agree. I don't know how much of it would have been considered. Like, if he had just, I mean, would you say that? Not just his, I mean, obviously you can say he preaches a racial mess, you know, a multiracial congregation message. And, you know, he may not, he may be doing that for marketing purposes and trying to get people pulled in, you know. But would you also say that about the fact that he and his wife, Marceline, adopted so many children of color yeah. including jim jr yeah. jim the jr. first is the, yeah the first black child adopted by white parents in the state of indiana yeah right it's it, uh, and, and that, maybe there maybe it was genuine yeah, at a maybe time so maybe and that's the frustrating thing about jim jones is you don't know how much of it's bullshit because at, at a certain point it becomes complete bullshit oh absolutely and but i the assassination the attempts thing, the faith healings right that faith healing, and faith that healing. made it and, and that made it so i didn't even know until this year that he was involved in integration in indiana and lunch counter sit-ins and shit you know <laughs> yeah yeah and and he help did people in major, those communities he did some major important work and that's why he was, you know, meeting with Rosalind Carter and all that, because like People's Temple, when when it started, kind of at the peak of its effectiveness, was an organization built by by a, this weird confluence of socialists and and old religious people we, who yes. who both agreed that they that the way to help people was to do it directly and here on earth and not to sit around praying for it and everybody believed in integration that was you know one of the key platforms of of people's temple early on um and deeply socialist that's why there's no apostrophe in people's temple it is you know it it, it, yes. it is it, the the people's organization and yes. and and would help again, would go into black communities and help people on an individual level to do kind of mundane shit, but stuff that was 10 times harder because they were black. And so people's temple would kind of 
pick up their cause. And as a result, they would pick up members along the way because nothing is going to advertise your movement better than being helped by that movement. Well, and it should also be noted that it did a lot for, a, for the, you know, elderly, you know, he was doing things for native Americans you know, he did some for the Latino community, but it, not as much, <laughs> it seems. I will say that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, when he was in Indiana and California and he was doing these different things, he, you know, he was working like, I mean, come on, when he was in the Bay Area, he was with dealing with George Moscone and Harvey Milk and Angela Davis, Dennis Means, like all Jane these, Fonda. like Jane Fonda, Jane <laughs> Fonda, right. These people were all progressive political figures, all, you know, heard him speak and all, you know, gave some credit to what People's Temple was doing. But by the time, even, I think, at least a couple years after them moving to the Bay Area, that's when shit just started going downhill behind the scenes. Really? Although, hadn't he been investigated for welfare fraud or something, or like social security fraud while uh... still in Indiana? Maybe I uh, I don't remember. Like it was Indiana, right around the time that he moved. Yeah, and you know, like Jim Jones uh, apparently was always, um, you know, a little bit on the the side of creative accounting. You know, and and I think again, I think at the beginning it came from a genuine place of, hey, these people are gonna, you know, donate sometimes substantially to People's Temple. But as a result, look at all this good work we're doing. And they're going to understand that because we're all good socialists. And and so, yeah, there is there is probably some manipulation of welfare money and stuff along the way uh, in the sense of like, hey, you're part of the People's Temple now. How about you just let me take care of those checks for you and I'll make sure you have food and all that stuff, you know? Right. Um, that all is the probably. the sandwiches you can eat. Right, exactly. And and, and well, as the book points out, that is, in, in some cases, that is more than people had. Right, right. And, you know, even I heard both from both Stephen and Jim Jones Jr., you know, Stephen Jones and Jim Jones Jr., that they both saw with their father this decline to where, with the financial. Like, mm. no it was like financially we were more at this one point and didn't, you could see where maybe he was starting to skim off, yeah. you know? So even, so that wasn't, didn't seem to be like an initial thing. Unlike what you see in so many other cults. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm the, looking. Yeah. I'm looking at you, Scientology. Um, yeah, right. That started L. as Ron a hustle from sure. the get go. Wanted that to have like tax loopholes, <laughs> like right. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean that was a very cynical creation because from jump, Scientology was about money and and doing kind of this big con, you know, like. L. Ron Hubbard thought he he could make a religion, and and sure enough did. Um, but yeah, I think with Jim Jones, it really was it's it all started from from a place that superficially at least it all looks like it was done for the right reasons, and right, and, and but eventually, and I I, I can't. I don't know which came first. If if he started skimping a little bit uh, or started skimming a little bit and started to wet his beak and start to understand that, hey, maybe this thing can be good for me, not just, you know, spiritually and, and as part of the movement, 
but I can also be this important political figure as well. And I can be, I can be a wealthy guy or I can live like a wealthy guy. You well, know? I think he knew very early on it could help him politically. Yeah. Because we see that in Indiana. I mean, he had appointment, like political, you know, community appointments there already. So, and that was even before the congregation got to, you know, a huge size and that kind of thing. So he saw that early on, but I think maybe some of that political power went to his head, like fed the, <laughs> the already, you know, megalomaniac, you know, this, this, this egotism, this ego that he had, I think it just fed to it. And he saw, and I don't know about when the drugs came into play, because then that seems like the drugs then came into play. Right. And as soon as and the then, drugs enter the picture, that's when the fake assassination shit starts. That's when he starts mm-hmm. to get paranoid and he starts oh, to get yeah. real wrapped up in his own bullshit. He starts because he's always, you know, even with all the, the fake healings and stuff, he's kind of presented this aura of like, I'm maybe a little bit, more than the common man you know that uh to to some of the religious people um they saw him as being sort of if not divine certainly close to divinity and and then for other people you know that like they point this out in the book that he would give these giant sermons and it would sound like total nonsense but the reason that they were so long and they went all over the place is cuz Jim Jones sort of knew his crowd to the point that he would throw in a few lines for everybody so that no matter who you were in people's temple like if you didn't if you weren't there for the religious shit he would say something about the uh the, the, the you know um the people's temple political agenda and uh the socialism angle that would kind of get you back in and you could be like oh yeah yeah fuck all that religious shit i don't care about that but i like what this guy says about um you know about helping our neighbors and Mm -hmm. and materialism and stuff well yeah and and back when i was on devour the podcast with you we there was an episode i forget what it was and the issue of cults came up and we were talking about if we could become a member of a cult and I'm like, okay, like I have to say I'd see something like Jonestown maybe without like all the religious (laughs) something, but like something that is more this utopian socialism and like, I could maybe get into that. Uh, you know what I mean? That's something I could maybe get behind. But I mm-hmm. know, but at least for a while, I know myself enough, though, that there would be a point where I'd be like, mm. but when they, when they start, when you have a leader who starts employing tactics like the sleep deprivation, for instance. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the food deprivation, but the sleep deprivation and then having you work so much. And that's what started in California, like in the Redwood Valley, when they start, they were building that community because so many people have regular like nine to five jobs. And then they would come over there and just continue working, you know, on the yeah. community so and on the land. So. And and that's where yeah because you it started to ramp up with uh w- with that work ethic shit yeah. of like you're you're in it for the cause to the point that Jim Jones would actively discourage relationships even marriages between people and and would encourage distance between them which did double duty of like hey in socialism who cares who you're married to. And I mean, it didn't get into sex cult stuff, but I mean, kind of does with. I mean, now with him, yes, he did. He did, you know, sexually abuse some individuals. 
you know. Absolutely, yeah. There, uh, that uh, the poor girl at the end, that that last girl that he took was just, that's the most horrifying story of Jonestown, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but it's not to the level of it, it's not what I would consider a key component, right? Of, of the abuse, the abuse was more physical and mental that took place. Um, yeah. And he was li- it just the scale on which it happened. Too. Right. Well, but so when he started doing the drugs and that's where he started to kind of buy into to all of his, you know, pseudo messianic bullshit. Yes. And and he starts to really lean into that. Um, call me father. Call me father. He starts to, uh, do, you know, like we were talking about with with splitting up relationships and that kind of thing. He starts to do that as a way for people to start depending on him more. And he takes he starts taking people, leaving people's temple really personally right. and, and is starting to shut that shit down. And that's where the cult hooks really start to get apparent, where it becomes difficult to to uh you know exorcise yourself from people's temple at a certain point when they're in california and you know like jim jones is also starting to try to flex uh, a little bit of political muscle at the same time but he gets smacked down pretty good like they're like we'll use your people but you're there's something a little kooky about people's temple so we're gonna keep arms length you know well at least by the time like I mean, because by the the time Moscone was getting elected as governor and Jim Jones had, you know, was worming his way in there and trying to get a really important position, you know, and didn't get exactly what he wanted. You know, that was also by that point, there had already been some questions raised publicly about people's temple and the conduct that goes on behind you know closed doors so well there were family members fairly early on you know not not like super early in the indiana days like there were people who had their questions about jim jones but especially by the time you get to california you have like family members who are like hey my kid is in Mm -hmm. in this in people's temple and I haven't heard from her when I hear from her, like it clearly sounds like something is off and and wanting people to investigate people's temple. But even, but even by the time, but I'm saying even by the time in the seventies, when Moscone was getting elected as um, mayor of San Francisco, um, there had already been some mysterious deaths of, of people's, temple members or who had just left you know that kind of thing wasn't there the guy that fell asleep on the train tracks or something like that yeah (laughs) like things like that were that were kind of like in only one time was like a people like someone of from people's temple actually investigated for it and he was acquitted but it was just like there were all these already in the early you know 70s like these grumblings that was like "Mm, wait a minute and you had report reporters already trying to do these exposés of some from with defectors you know because there already had been defectors at that point yeah and and jim jones one of my favorite stories in all of uh, road to jonestown is he started to get you know again by this point he's doing the drugs he's getting a little paranoid uh, and by little, I mean a lot. Yeah. And, and so there's that story where somebody's going to publish, um, an article on people's temple. And there's the girl who is in Pe- people's temple and she gets her parents to come to visit Jim Jones, where he talks to them and tries to explain, uh, their point of view. Uh, and it's all over the fact that the reporter left his briefcase behind. So Jim Jones is like, give us a day. Let us look at it, stuff like that. And then he gets a phone call and he's like, oh, okay, you guys can leave. I forget what I was saying. And so they get home and they realize that while they were meeting with Jim Jones, the daughter 
had taken the briefcase and made photocopies of everything inside it. Yeah. And so Jim Jones was actively trying to suppress news stories and reports of that, that negatively impacted people's temple. Um, and yes. And by this point he is like, he is covering up the fact that there is some weird, like <laughs> genital beating shit going on within the walls of people's temple that nobody knows about beyond the walls or should is, is supposed to know about. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> That's- I, I don't know where to go from here because it, I mean, do we want to get into, well, yeah. Where do we want to go from here? I think, I think it's important, you know, maybe as a transitional point to say like, this is kind of the, that weird middle period when People's Temple was still doing some good in the world. Oh, yeah. But Jim Jones was becoming more isolated. He was starting to get pretty nutty on the drugs by this point. This is where the sunglasses come into play because he wears the dark sunglasses because his eyes are always fucked up because of all the drugs he's on. Yep. And uh, and then um, he starts looking at a socialist paradise because he starts preaching kind of doomsday stuff about how they as good socialists are, are going to be driven either out of this country or the government's going to come get them. You know, it's very apocalyptic cult kind of talk. The deep state is going to come get you and take away your socialism. Yeah. I mean, that it's truly what it was. And it's, there was all this bullshit about like, maybe we're going to go to Cuba mm-hmm. uh, because he became pro communist and not just socialist <laughs> at, a, well, at a certain point. Well, he, well, he was always calling himself Marxist. Yes. Not and he would refer to, he would sometimes refer to the church's beliefs as apostolic socialism. Uh huh. And, so, but he used the word communalism in many of his tapes and, and and things rather than communism. And it really was like he carefully chose that word, you know, so that it was like, no, we're doing our own thing because we're not exactly like them. You know, it was still, but we're, you know, we're friendly with them. <laughs> it was yeah. interesting how we danced around the language, even though much of the rhetoric, um, not the religious portion, but each, uh, you know, even though much of like the economic rhetoric he was preaching was the same. Yeah. And so he starts to investigate and explore places to uh expand the uh, expand people's temple and and effectively because what he wanted was his own nation he wanted his own country and and that wasn't gonna happen well and the attempt well and moving the congregation from kind of indiana to california in the redwood valley that was an attempt to do it but he that wasn't enough for him yeah and and he's jim jones enjoys nothing if not a test run and well so, and i mean that goes yes i mean look at how many of the night whites rehearsals started even before moving to guyana yeah they like the the one thing that a lot of people uh, perhaps don't know or appreciate is that well before, you know, the mass uh, murder at, at Guyana, you know, there were te- like, he would just have the congregation or like people close to him uh, drink, you know, whatever, have a beverage wine or, or uh, he didn't do alcohol. So it was probably, you yeah. know, soda or whatever. Well, but, no, uh, I, I heard that he did on a few occasions say, you know, cause even though it was normally like no alcohol, it was like, Oh yeah, let's have a glass of wine. And 
like survivors saying, oh, wow, this is a real treat. I, I was excited, you know. Yeah. And then afterwards, they were told that, yeah, it's poison. You, you have 45 yeah, you minutes poison. until you yeah. die. Yeah. And I have a <laughs> nuclear weapon set to explode. So don't worry about the children or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he would just see how people reacted like, uh -huh. OK, how, how, what can I get away with? See, that's the point where, like, if that, I would have been like, I'm fucking out. Right. <laughs> that's right. the point but, where I would have been like, no way. I don't go. And the, all right. So here's the, the, the other side of it. This is the, the boiling the frog part of it is that once he starts behaving this way, right. Most people would be like, I would be fucking out of there. But also but... <laughs> you, by that point, you had kind of gotten used to a certain level of Jim Jones's bullshit. And so when he says that he poisoned everybody, a lot of people were like, no, he didn't. <laughs> and and but, sure enough, he didn't. And but so you know what you said it exactly earlier. He groomed people. Yes. He yes. groomed them like a pedophile. Yes. Into, that is what cult leaders do in any any magnetic you know, charismatic figure, Hitler did it, you know? It's that same thing of working the rhetoric up over time, breaking your spirit, your individual spirit down, mm -hmm. and your free will down, or you feel, even if you have free will, you feel so trapped that you don't see that you have a way out, and that this is your only choice. It's like being in an abusive relationship. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like domestic, like domestic abuse. Right. And, and in many ways, uh, similar in the situation also in that a lot of these people were financially dependent on Jim Jones and People's Temple. That was the next thing I was going to say is that how many of these people, especially the ones who are had moved already from Indiana out mm -hmm. to the Redwood Valley. They had already been the ones to sell their houses and whatever property and given up all the sense. So they were so financially invested. I was watching a documentary with one of the early converts who did that, where he and his family moved from Indiana and sold their house at that point. So, and they, they were even like, you know, kind of when they were in California, there were still things every once in a while they'd be like, eh, okay. And, but they're like, no, it seems to be better. And then by the time they get to Guyana and to Jonestown, they are, they immediately knew, oh shit, this is not what I signed up for. Yeah. And they try to say things and they are quick they quickly learn by physical beatings that shut the fuck up like you stay in line well and, and right so in the early goings of Jonestown it's they they make this arrangement with the Guyana government to have a settlement that's going to grow over like a decade and if they send like the pioneers are, are what he calls them from people simple who are kind of the hardiest people who are kind of like, look, man, you're going to go down there and, and Guyana is no joke. You're going to be clearing out super dense jungle. There's no amenities or anything like you're cool. creating the civilization there. And, and keep in mind, they had, purchased about 3,800 acres. Yeah. And this is c complete jungle. You know, Georgetown is the capital of Guyana. Port Kaituma is 150 miles away from there. That is the closest airstrip to Jonestown. So between Port Kaituma and Jonestown, that's 20 miles. So you know, you're out in the middle of just nowhere. Yeah. And they even, and that was in 74. And then the first people started coming there in 77. 
they had still they still didn't really have enough sustainable crops at that point even in th- you know 3 years like to be able to you know make do for the thousand people who came they were still having to bring in food from you yeah. know port kaitum and you know other like other places in guyana yeah well the the dream was that they would make enough food to support themselves and also sell some yes but, i they mean they weren't there yet they not, weren't. i mean not for years would it have no. been able to no and and but no. they had money in the bank like there were there were millions of dollars as it happened in a lot right. of different accounts so <laughs> yeah, jonestown could have survived <laughs> Finan- financially it could have survived uh, for for many many years, but uh, by that point, you know Jim Jones was just so paranoid and crazy that like he was he he was gonna kill himself and others. It was just a question of when and how. Um, but yeah, but so as they they start sending people to Guyana and they'll go down and they'll they'll make these visits where they come back with pictures of them holding big bushels of fruit and stuff like that that it turns out that they bought and brought with them to stage these photographs right right and you know and, and then they uh th- things in California start to heat up though that's really the turning point is because one of the members of People's Temple is coming after him on a child custody case, the the lawyer. Yeah. And also there are reports, finally, like, honest to goodness, detailed investigative reports start getting published about what's going on inside People's Temple. You know, before we get into all the horror of People's yeah. Temple, Please. since... I have you on the show. I know. I, I I figured you would have been very excited when you know you're talking about Jim Jones had sold monkeys. <laughs> he sold monkeys door to door. It was the best detail of the whole book. Was right? that for a while he would get wholesale spider monkeys and would go door to door selling them for what twenty nine dollars a pop. Yep. Yeah. And when they moved to Jonestown, one of those residents was the children's pet chimp, Mr. Muggs. Yes, who who Jones claimed that he rescued from like an animal lab or something, but probably did not. Probably did not. Yeah. <laughs> probably but, just bought him somewhere because yeah, he had but, a hookup with wild animals. But since I have you here, you know, yes. I figured yes. you would appreciate that, not just me. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I... I was so delighted when I read that <laughs> because it it's just such an absurd notion that like this guy, know. Who, you know, was capable and, and performed such atrocity, but also was, you know, this guy who could be kind of funny and, and disarming and sold monkeys door to door. And, um, but it, it, it goes to show you, he can sell anything. The, yeah, right, right. I mean, you don't have to work too hard to sell somebody a monkey. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Depends on how much you know about monkeys. The less <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. the more likely you are to buy one. <laughs> <Right>. True. <laughs> I, I can't remember if it was in the book or if it was just in that one documentary where the one girl said that her sister met him because her monkey had killed itself. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah, oh, there was there's this woman. I remember that. Oh, it, then it must have been this document. I think it was the PBS documentary. And she, you know, she's an older lady at that point, but she said that her sister met Jim Jones because her monkey had hanged itself. Uh-huh. And then they found his ad in the paper that he was selling monkeys. And then he, you know, like, I don't know if he had monkeys in a suitcase, like a tile salesman <laughs> or however he did. They probably just on his shoulders. You know, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Wearing sunglasses too. <laughs> Pray for Mojo. I. I. Yeah. I. I figure that's the way his monkeys were. Maybe not the ones he sold, but anyway. And then it was. Well, I got this monkey, and I'm going to church with this guy next week. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You should c- come with me. Maybe he can lay hands on your monkey. Yeah. Pull out. Pull out some of those rancid chicken parts. Whoa. That's oh man, 
I, 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 another detail I really love. So just like random people before we get into the horror, random fun people's temple shit. Um, I love the fact that he would, when he had his people who would go around and like collect the tumors, the in quotes tumors, <laughs> the rancid chicken parts, I that know. he would be like, hey, if somebody gets too close to it, eat it real quick. <laughs> and, and, and like some of the people were like, hey, won't I get cancer then? And he's like, no, 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 you're cool. I've, I, don't worry. I got you. I got your back. But don't let anybody get too good a look at it is what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, like he was, that's the thing is Jim Jones was every bit the grifter that his mother was, but for a while it the looked showman. like he, yes, he, he was doing it for all the right reasons, but then but like then. <laughs> the reasons left and just the circus was what remained and, and feeding his own ego. And so when, when shit started to pop off in California and like, hey, we've got Guiana kind of waiting for us. We've got some people down there that are setting up camp. Um, then that's the point where he's like, all right, everybody pack up your shit. We're going to Guiana. We're going to, um, uh, what, what do you call it? Paradise? What was it? Uh, we're go- the promised land, the PL. We're going to the promised land. Yeah. No, uh, he continued to use a lot of biblical language. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, it was like the extreme example of packing up from Indiana to go to California this time. It's like, no, 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 we're going to a whole different country. Um, it, we're, it, we're going to be completely on our own down there. It's going to be great. And then, you know, and people went, people lobbied for position to go. People wanted to go to Jonestown. Because it was the promised land and you were going there with father and it was going to be everything. Like, did you see all the pictures of the fruit? You know, it's going to be amazing down there. And, and so he picked up with a bunch of people and went down to Guyana. And, and like you were saying, Vanessa, like people got down there and were like, this fucking sucks. (laughs) But you're, what are you going to do? Like the, the, the gimmick was you, People's Temple will pay for your way there, but they will not help you get back. So mm-hmm. if you didn't have any money, you don't have your passport. It's 20 miles through the jungle to get to the nearest civilization. You're you're stuck. You're with them. And yeah. and plus the the place was not ready to take all of these people. And so now we're you're working around the clock to try to build out enough space for everybody to kind of live somewhat comfortably so you're not eating great you're working all the fucking time and you're constantly inundated and you're not sleeping yeah and over over the pa all the time is just hello children (laughs) i just want to talk to you for the next two and a half hours about socialism and some of the people in the camp who have done me wrong and (laughs) and he would he would like you know he he would point out people that he felt had you know disobeyed him somehow and that's where you got into that weird crazy peer pressure stuff of the true believers making the people who were like hey this doesn't seem like a very smart thing to do and maybe we should think about going back to america and why why aren't we going to russia like you said in the first place and he would get all the true believers to shout down any naysayers and it became very difficult for anybody in people's temple to stand up to not just Jim Jones, but to stand up to other members of people's temple. And he encouraged children to rat on their parents and shit. Well, and that's part, that's part of it is that not just encouraged children, but he had encouraged this snitching atmosphere for a very long time Mm -hmm. so that yes, even children were like, you know, he passed a note, you yeah. know, whatever. Well, right. And I mean, that that all goes back to boiling the frog, right? Like there, this had all been happening for so long that by the time you get to Jonestown, so much of this like creepy cult behavior is baked in. But now you're in this much tighter feedback loop 
where you're j- you're lo- you're locked in with father like you're on you're totally on for the ride at that point real civilization is nowhere around you it's just it's him it is him telling you the news all the time and telling you all like you know uh good, good work everybody in the jungle uh his father again just want to tell you that race wars have broken out in the united states we are so lucky to be here in Jonestown with nothing to eat and no sleep. It is a wonderful time to be alive. I love you all, except for the three of you who are now in the timeout box. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And, yeah, and that shit would just go on all the time. And, and like yet and so when you start to wonder like how did these people do it, for a lot of people, man, suicide was not the worst <laughs> option. You know, like yeah. it had been a bad, bad place for a while. Like people were tired. People were ready. Uh, like a lot of people were ready to check out just because living in the jungle fucking sucked. Right. Right. Um, yeah, it was. And any time you isolate people like that their will also is broken down more. So even the, you know, some of the ones who might have been, you know, more on board before, like, you know, and it doesn't give them an opportunity to really start seeing just how bad it's getting. Yeah. Because, you know, they're out there and they're just, again, so isolated that it's like, no, this is what you know, this is what's right. And then when you are not, you don't get any input from the outside world, you're only getting it from one news source. Um, <laughs> right, you're, all of you your know news what I'm comes saying? from it's, father, yeah. It's the same thing, as, you know, even someone who, like, a, you know, just saying in the United States that lives in the United States and might who only watch one news source or something, you know, and rely just on that for their only view of the world. Right. <laughs> You're only seeing one thing, whatever that is. Uh, tonight on father news network, that's FNN. And we're going to take a look at, uh, how the jungle is good for all of us. And also an exclusive interview interview with me, Father, after I take four bennies. I think everyone's going to have a real, real good time at that one. I'm I'm planning to go long. Um, so yeah, it, it like it, it's just like that that entire environment was set up so that everything everything was stacked against any kind of independent or critical thought, you know. Jim Jones didn't want that. The people who were loyal to him, who had, who were, who were the faithful, they didn't want that. It was easier to go along. Like they lived in an inverted world where the inmates were truly running the asylum. And, and, and Jim Jones at this point, it's worth pointing out. Like once he gets to Jonestown, he also really up the pill popping. Um, yep. Was, was yep. almost catatonic at times. And so the people around him, the true believers, were kind of protecting everybody else in, in Jonestown from seeing him at his worst. Well, and and were making sure that the trains ran on time and were and and were keeping everybody in line. You know, they were there were some petty cruelties that they visited on people too, because they had a little power. Yeah, and the thing is is that when you say that he started with increase with the, the pills. I mean, you can tell the tapes that he started making at that point, he starts slurring more and more and more. And you're just like, Whoa, yeah, this is crazy. And, and I will say some of his tapes are worth listening to. Um, I mean, to hear like he, what, what he was like prior to coming to Jonestown and to just hear the kind of charisma that he did carry. Yeah. The, the early tapes, cause he built so much of his, his ministry and, and his style off of black churches. Yes. So his, his prayer meetings in the early days, they were really raucous. He talked 
very uh he didn't he didn't speak the way a lot of preachers did it wasn't uh airy language he talked very directly and would use profanity sometimes and stuff like that like he seemed like a regular a regular guy he was like the cool sunday school teacher only magnetically charismatic times 10 and and uh, people loved him you know that's why that's why they went to guiana that's why you know, uh, I, again, when when you ask the if fundamental question of how could people do this, it's because they fell in love with a guy who constantly helped them, told them he loved them, all that stuff. And these were these were people who were in many cases on the fringe of society for one reason or another, be it old or black. Like he united everybody that didn't fit in, and. Yeah. And it, it worked, you know, like he was, he he is like in those early days, as you were saying, it's worth listening to because you can totally see why people wanted to get behind this guy. Well, and even when he was still in California before he moved down there Mm -hmm. to Guyana, it, it, it's a totally different story. And there were there have been survivors who've said that you could just you heard it in his voice just in even like the content of the sermon or whatever that he started delivering you know he started sounding much more menacing when they all moved down to Jonestown and became more isolated yeah when there was nowhere to go and he, again, it was nothing but drugs and paranoia. And that's, that was his diet. Um, that, yeah. Then he just started seeing more and more like what crazy shit he could get away with. You know, like you, you started to have more of those poison test runs and, and those white nights when, you know, he would just wake everybody up and be like, we got we got to get out of here, everybody. We got to load up and we got to uh, get to Port Katoom. And they would get to the gates of Jonestown. He'd be like, all right, now I'm just bullshitting. I just want to make sure that in, in uh, the event of an emergency, everybody could get out in time. Um, you know, crazy stuff like that. And it just made everybody goofy. <laughs> you know, I think it's the, the psychological term for it. When you go goofy and and people were they were absolutely just dazed and addled and and that kind of thing i mean it it was a nightmare and 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 like we were talking about like his his sexual behavior became mm-hmm. more erratic as well and um and the most horrifying thing i think her name was is it like Letitia james something like that i can't remember her name now unfortunately um it, that's it's the, the attorney general of new york all right, definitely not Letitia James. <laughs> it no. might be, but I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, I want to say that the girl's name was Letitia, though. But anyway, I apologize. Okay. Uh, allegedly, the attorney general. Um, <laughs> the but, but there was a girl, because somebody gave him some shit at one point about how he always preached racial equality but never took any black lovers. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, he had this whole drugged out speech about how, you know, he had to have sex with white women because they were the ones who needed the release and the let go. Black women were fine. But anyway, he yeah, gets around. I know. I know. And here, when you are talking about Jonestown, 45 percent of that population were black women. Yeah. That yeah. should be pointed out. That should be pointed out. That was the largest demographic of Jonestown. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it truly was like, there was a real rainbow coalition of, of people in, in people's temple, but there was, he, he finally did select a, a a young black woman that was like, Hey, this is going to be my new lover. And Mm -hmm. she turned him down. And so he had her drugged taken to, uh, his like private tent where she was kept drugged in a bedroom yep until and until the the massacre and it should like that is to me that was the the one story that was like oh my god that was 
that, what a what a horrifying end. Like it's all horrible, but that in particular, for that to be the last days of your life, is just nightmarish. It's it, it, like that's the point where there is no question. Jim Jones has become a total monster. Uh, Absolutely. And, Absolutely. So like he, and you know, there were more problems, uh, once they get to Guiana, um, and as shitty as it all is there and as crazy as Jones is, there's real world problems where members of Jonestown people's temple, uh, civilians, members of their family back in the States are starting to ask a lot of questions about what's going on in Guiana. They're worried about their kids down there and, and it's starting to, to get a little bit of momentum at the government level. And this is where the ball starts rolling for the trip that Congressman Ryan takes to Jonestown to kind of do this big press event to, to go down, see for himself what's going on in Jonestown. And this, that's where everything spins completely out of control. Well, right. Right. Was so the, I, sorry, was the no, woman you're ahead. trying to think of earlier, Deborah Layton? It, probably. Oh, wait. Yeah. No, uh, I saw no, that. No, no, no. The Layton girl, she was, um, she was a kind of a willing accomplice. If I, if I remember. Oh, okay. I I just remembered that she was, she wrote about the sexual assault or something like that from the temple, but that's all I had jotted down. Yeah. I I'd have to look it up again. in in the book, I don't remember the, the poor girl's name. I just remember that story and being like, that is again, one of the most fucked up things I've ever heard. (laughs) It's, it's uh, just, you know, it's the worst. Like Jim Jones was, a a you know, what began so well, like that's, uh, this is the whole people's simple story, right? It is, it started off with helping people get their bills paid. And now he is drugging women and keeping them captive. And it's, it's horrifying. Yeah, I know. It's kind of like, whoa, 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 time out. (laughs) Like where you have gone so far off this path of anything that was possibly good. (laughs) Like, yeah, and but again, it's the the boiling the frog, and it's, and like, it's in downright you are a monster. Yes, yeah. you know, like I I I a hundred percent see how we got here. Um, there's not a lot of mystery to how all these people now who are tired and sleep deprived and and drunk on the demagoguery of of Jim Jones. Like there are a lot of. Uh, very real Trump parallels to Jim Jones in the way that he he took legitimate social issues and exploited them and and uh, you know resorted to hyperbole and just crazy make em ups until people were so stirred up and crazy that they would do anything for Jim Jones. Well, look at even when you have a congregation that has such a large population of black people, just even choosing the name white knights Mm -hmm. as like the most like horrific event you could face. Like it conjures this imagery of, you know, the, the horror of like racial inequality and terror that has been perpetuated throughout U S history. You know, it's the it's the same it other end of what the Trump rhetoric where he was saying the anti, you know, immigrant rhetoric that he spewed. Yeah. To some yeah. extent. I mean, to some extent, if you want to put it that way. It's it I mean, the politics are different, but the, the politics are different, but it's the same fuel yes. and kind of area of Rare rhetoric, yeah, you know, um, yeah. It, it, it's it's I'm on the one who can fears. help you out of this. Yeah, it is. It, I yeah. am the I am the Messiah. I am the one 
only I can fix this. That is, you know, that that was what mm-hmm. Trump said. That Jim Jones was the same way. I know the way out of this. You're all, you have all been discarded by this society. You have been minimized. You have been marginalized. I'm gonna lead you out of this. I can do it. And and that's a message that there's a lot of people who want to hear uh, somebody say that, and and especially with the kind of charisma and charm that Jim Jones had, you know, again very Trumpian. Like I I I kind of loathe Donald Trump, but I'll be the first to admit that there is a weird charisma to the guy that makes it, uh, you know, somewhat understandable for people to get on board. It it doesn't appeal to me, but I get it. I see it. Um. And Jim Jones is the same thing. It is, you know, it it is not the message. It's the messenger. It, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't matter what he's getting these people worked up and scared about as long as he's getting them worked up and scared. And and then he can have them do whatever the fuck he wants. And, and you know, uh, uh, then this uh, congressman comes to town. And and he's super paranoid about it, um, as as well he should be. Like there's awful shit happening in Jonestown, but uh, the people have like they there were quarterly visits by the State Department in Jonestown, so they were pretty practiced at hey when somebody shows up, you put your best foot forward. Here are the people he's going to talk to. You don't let anybody. Uh, get too chatty with with the officials coming to visit, and then you get them in, you get them the fuck out of there, and you go about life uh, as usual. And that's kind of how everyone was telling. Because originally Jim Jones doesn't want Ryan to come, and everybody's like, "No, no, no, let him come, let him see. Like it'll just be like one of those State Department tours. Let him come to have dinner, we'll sing, and all that stuff. And then he goes home and he tells everybody everything's fine." And so Jones, through his drug addled days, finally agrees to that. And and so that's kind of what happens. Like Ryan goes around and meets with people in Jonestown and, and Jones himself. And at the dinner uh, that night says, hey, you know, there are every, everyone I have talked to. Uh, the, the people uh, here in Jonestown would wouldn't want to be anywhere else. So, you know, he seemed at that moment, he seemed like everything was cool. Like they they were going to get away with it. And, and then Jones shot himself in the foot, you know, almost, almost literally. Uh, but he just got paranoid. It was the drugs and the paranoia. Like Jonestown could have survived the strip from Ryan. Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. But I do think they got jumpy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah a little um, bit <laughs> a little bit but i think i i don't know i i think to some extent it was allowed to happen do you you, you well because people were raising the alarm on state side that were like hey he was running suicide drills like jim jones might kill these people well okay so here's what i want to get into with with some I mean, some conspiracy theories that have been raised and uh-huh. some of them, I think, bullshit. Have, have we reached okay. the final day? If if we've reached the final day, it might be a good uh, stop point before we get into that, because I imagine that's going to go for a while. <laughs> OK, do we? Yeah. Do we want to talk about the final day first? Yeah, probably so. Probably. Let's wrap up what is commonly known as as the the final day of Jonestown. OK. Um, which, which is there had been some rumored defections during the night, uh, you know, people slipping notes to reporters and shit like that saying like, Hey, get us the fuck out of here. And there had already to, you know, been defections in from Jonestown since they moved, since people moved to Guyana. Yes. Okay. That is, that it can be said. There were people who made it out in Jones, t- like while in Guyana, but prior to this final day. Yes. Not, not and, many, not many, but there right. were a few. Yeah. It was really tough to do it. Um, and it, and it cost a lot of money. And, and so, yes, most people did not be, even, there were plenty of people who wanted out of Jonestown who never left. So Jones, because he's all, 
uh, jumpy, <laughs> as we said, um, yeah. ab- about these defections and Ryan being there. And like we were saying, he takes this defection bullshit real personal. Oh, absolutely. And and so the people around him were like, hey, we lost maybe 20, 30 people. That's nothing good. Like, we, we're having trouble sustaining ourselves now. If these people want to leave, let them go. But Jim Jones just can't let that happen because he's he's the Messiah. So right. how could you how could you allow these people to walk away? And and that he, he's sure that if they leave, they're gonna rat on all the shit that's been going down in Jonestown, and that's going to bring him down. And so he, you know, th- I don't know that this is directly proven but the idea is that he directs one of his underlings to stab uh ryan uh to to kill congressman ryan and and this dude uh i can't remember his name now but one of the one of the inner circle dudes um actually does he attacks congressman ryan and stabs him in the arm but it doesn't it doesn't kill him and jim jones acts like he didn't know this was happening it and the and the guy mm-hmm. seems to lose his nerve and doesn't finish the job right and so ryan is like i'm getting the fuck out of here so he and the reporters all haul ass to the airfield uh close to to guiana to get out of there yeah yeah the port kaituma airfield yeah and so at this point, Jones sends uh, the you know some more of his gunmen, the the really hardcore faithful, because the, I, I, the bread brigade. Yeah, that like a lot of these guys, you know, they we haven't talked about this a ton, but a lot of a lot of the people uh, in Jonestown, not a lot, but some of the people were ex cons who couldn't get work, and some of them were still pretty violent criminals, and so. Jones had no problems arming these people. And as long as they were faithful, he could kind of use their innate anger issues. One might say that uh, to his, his advantage that relates partly to my uh, goes under one of my uh, conspiracy theory things too. So, okay. So <clears throat> half but, under that umbrella. So, okay. yeah. So, all right. So footnote there, we will, we will do conspiracy theories, uh, in a moment. And so they show up at the airfield, the, these gunmen and they, they end up killing, um, one of the, the temple members who was leaving. Uh, they, of course, Ryan is killed and, um, a couple of other people are shot three there and, and then kills three, um, media people. Right, three of the uh, like the New York Times reporters or something, uh, and two from a- a NBC. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. So th- that, of course, is uh, the and there what, were defectors at that site who got away. Yeah, some like, of them like did, hid in the jungle for a mm-hmm. while, and, and like, uh, but would have to wait for hours, waiting oh. for somebody to show up to help, and and in some cases, oh my shot. god, I heard an interview with a woman who was 12 at that time and she and her younger sister who i think was 10 ran from the airstrip their father with his mother and their brother hid in another area but it was their mother got shot on the airstrip anyway but if the two girls you know ran into the jungle and were lost out there for day, like a couple of days and started getting sick with God knows what kind of disease. <laughs> like, I don't right, know. Just whatever fungus Dysentery, from the jungle. I mean, who yeah. knows? De- they were dehydrated and everything. And finally they made it out to this, you know, you know, area of water and they saw people who were, looking for survivors like you know but here it was days later yeah but they thought for sure they st- they were like because they were so sick they were started like hallucinating they you know they were in the jungle they could have been killed by an animal <laughs> like 
yeah. two, you know, two girls that had like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, there were big jungle cats and stuff like that, uh, that, you know, that, well, like the, the jungle was dangerous. Really? Well, and that area of Guyana is still largely unpopulated and undeveloped. It's mostly the part that is close to Georgetown on the east side of this country. Guyana, I mean, uh, Georgetown's in Port Kaituma are much closer to the Venezuelan west border of the country. So it's, it's really interesting. I, I, yeah, I got into really a lot about Guyana and the country, and I'm going to say a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. Because I think it's worth mentioning, but go ahead. Yeah. So uh, at this point, once Joan sends the gunman out, he's pretty much locked in. Like, all right, th- this shit is about to go down. And well, and wasn't there a guy who was pretending to be a defector who yeah, was there? Yes had orders to kill Ryan and then he got stuck on the plane and, you know, and he didn't get in place to kill Ryan. And yeah. so it ended up being the red brigade that, or what, that had to shoot him. Yeah. That right. Uh, yeah. Because that like, dude ended totally up getting accident. arrested. Yeah. Like he, he, yeah, he ends up fucking up and they, and, and gets disarmed essentially. Yeah. And, and yeah, so then they send the red brigade and once the red brigade brigade is riding, like once they're punching the clock and are headed towards the airfield, um, that's where Jones is pretty much like, all right, folks, it's time. And, and there had been a doctor who for some time had been, developing the perfect mix of flavor aid and cyanide um, that would be as good tasting as possible and still make sure to deliver a lethal dose. And right. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that Jim Jones had to get his jeweler's license. So he, in order to purchase cyanide. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that is horrifying about all of this um, is that the all all of this was done for the low low price of about eight and a half dollars? There uh-huh. was the, there was about eight dollars and change worth of cyanide that killed every 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 person that died of poisoning in Jonestown died from eight dollars of cyanide. It's just the worst. And so the uh the it, then it's time then it's hey we 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 have tested it on our test subjects here we've given them the drink they all died uh in fairly short order um now let's give it to the masses and um again i don't recommend anyone listen to it because it's haunting but the last tapes from jonestown as jim jones is recording and telling people like you know hurry 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 and it starts off like when he gives his big last speech he he starts off with like you know i've tried so hard to to love you all as best i can and it's it's this again it's the messiah complex of you know i'm i'm so tired we have we have fought for so long he was obsessed with masada which was a uh, a a an act of revolutionary suicide mm-hmm. done done by uh, Jews when they were surrounded by the Romans, and uh, the Romans laid siege to this uh, mountain top town of Masada, and rather than be taken into slavery, every man, woman, and child slit their throats, and. Uh, and Jim Jones was always, uh, enamored by that act. Like he, he, it was a, one of those historical facts that stuck in his head and he was always obsessed with it. And now he had an opportunity to do his own Masada. And that's how he pitched it to people was he, he would call uh, suicide frivolous and silly and a waste, but this was an act of revolution. And so this made it meaningful that them laying down their lives was a political statement that a, a, uh, a, an organization 
that was purely socialist and only wanted to do good that left to its own devices the countries and governments of the world will stamp it out and that's what he was telling people is they're coming for you because of what happened uh with ryan they're going to come for us and they're going to take your kids they're going to take the old people where what we are going to do is all lay down our lives as one and that will be uh, a statement that will echo through eternity and and that's the pitch he made and a lot of people were on board for it. And a lot of people who stood up and were like, hey, what about going to Russia? Get shouted down. And you can hear it on the tapes. People being like, no, no, no. We've tried that. You know, like they're never going to let us. And, and that's Jones's argument is like, you think after what happened today, Russia's going to want us? No, this is our only option now. Um, it's it's terrifying. Uh, like I said, I don't recommend anyone listen to it. But a, as in terms of hearing the moment where a, a, a human being decides to murder almost a thousand people, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, in, it's, uh, it is intense to put it mildly. Um, especially, you know, you hear on the tape, like children crying, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, you hear adults crying too, for that matter, but the, you know, the children crying, um, it was ultimately 919 people that died. Mm -hmm. Um, five people at the air, the Fort Kaituma airstrip, four people at the Jonestown. I mean, the, not uh, at the, uh, sorry, the Georgetown outpost at the Capitol. Cause there was, like Sharon Amos, who was like a big true believer and she ended up killing herself and children. But the other people that were there, uh, was Jim Jr. And Stephen Jones, who were both kind of helped control that situation and also made sure there was no radio to peep, you know, followers in California to also participate in this. So they potentially saved lives. Um, I, absolutely, yeah, Jim, they saved Jim lives. Senior yeah. was like the dolphins are in the jacuzzi or whatever he said on the <laughs> phone, and that's the okay. It's time to do it. No, it's um, what is it, Go Mrs. Frazier? Yeah, it's Mrs. Frazier is. Oh, what was Coming it? To dinner. It was something you know, like they're talking yeah. about. We need more Bibles. We're running out of. Running out of Bibles down here. I have it written. I haven't written somewhere, but it's yeah, Mrs. Fra something about Mrs. Fraser. Um, but but anyway, and then at Jonestown itself, it was nine hundred people. So I mean, two hundred and seventy kids. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of children, a lot of old people, uh, a lot of you know. As we talked about, like there were plenty of 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 kids that were it not down for well, down and for I'm murder so, and i'm sorry but when everybody the the media and the u.s government has called it and people collectively call it a suicide a mass suicide i'm sorry those children did not choose that they didn't yeah. have consent in this process yeah no and, and especially you know. when you see you know how many of them were forced to take it yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it, 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 kind of how we started this discussion about, you know, was this, uh, was this murder? Was this, uh, suicide? And I just, I don't know how you come away from this thinking that this was purely murder yeah, or purely suicide. Like, you know, as we said, this was, it, Jim Jones grooming, these people, especially the true believers in Jonestown, to do this for a while. And further, <laughs> the ones who weren't on board, who were just stuck in Jonestown, were uh, absolutely murdered, either either shot or forcibly injected. And so, yeah, I think it is undoubtedly a mass murder. I don't I don't think you can call it a mass suicide, because like I said, I'm I'm just of the firm belief that the you know vast vast majority of people 
uh, at Jonestown who died that day would never have died if they did not meet Jim Jones or not in that way. Like they would never have killed themselves without the influence of Jim Jones. And it's, it, it's one of those things that's difficult to measure. It, it has the, almost that Manson quality of like, well, what, what is his personal uh, sort of responsibility in all of this, you know, cause Manson, you can kind of waver and be like, well, he didn't, he influenced these people, but he didn't really commit any murders himself. Uh, that but you know of. that you're right. That you know of. And there's a lot of argument that maybe killing people wasn't his idea in the first place, that it was just an escalation within the dynamics of the family and so forth that he'd started the ball rolling, but never really meant for it to get to that place. And, but I, I think Jim Jones was in love with the idea of, of a mass murder like this. I think he loved the idea of having, being able to command his people to do this and watching them do it. Well, he was in love with the power. Definitely to be able to, you know, manipulate a situation and people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, on that note, let's take a brief break and then we will come back and we can get into some more nitty gritty. And um, I'll throw a few <laughs> conspiracy theories out there. Some a little too crazy, but some that, you know, yeah. add to the complexity of this situation that you're like, I could see that kind of making a little bit sense so well yeah the the fun and thing then about we'll talk jones, about the movie but yeah the fun thing about the the story i mean in, in as much as any of this is fun i mean it's a horrible event but right, right. it's a fascinating story and one of the things that's that's especially fascinating about it is because we so we know so much of the detail because we do have these tapes and we have the the written records of uh you know uh, uh jones's r- kind of right hand woman who went around and like killed all the wild animals and made sure that, you know, everybody in the, uh, in the cabanas were dead as well. And all that, um, that we know a lot of detail supplied by like her letter and those tapes and, and eyewitness accounts and that kind of thing. But there is enough fog of mystery around some of it because, because there aren't a lot of eyewitness survivors to some of the pieces of this. And, and it makes it especially interesting and, and truly the only people who know the full story died that day, you know, uh, who, who know exactly all the machinations of the whys and wherefores of why that day, why did, why did Jim Jones suddenly snap? Was there, was it the, the, the child custody thing? Is that what really did it? Was it the Ryan thing? Was that what really did it? Was it the confluence of that plus other legal troubles, plus people sniffing around about his money that was starting to, to happen as well. Um, yeah, it's, there's enough mystery that a good conspiracy theory can flourish here. So I'm excited. Cool. Okay. On that note, We will be back shortly. Okay. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema B, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho-Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. (laughs) 
I guess we're back now. Are we officially back? I thought I heard Darren. Uh, yes, I, I am back, and the recording was rolling during our break, so... Oh, okay. Might have been back even before I started talking. <laughs> okay. All right. That, that's up but to no, the editor. Bo, well, Bo and I continued talking, but I thought I heard you come back. To, to get into a little... I want to bring up a little bit more information about Guyana. So, because it gives you some insight into this situation down there, I think, of the Guyana was, it was a Dutch colony for, for a while, and then it was under British rule until 1966. But in 1953, it had elected by popular vote, a Marxist leader. And at that point, the U.S. started sending CIA down there to kind of surveil what was going on. Mm -hmm. And it has been confirmed as a fact, okay, that the U.S. funded opposition uh, uh, kind of strikes the, against the Guyanese Marxists in the 50s and 60s. And they were also trying to purposely raise tensions between Indo-Guyanians and, and Afro-Guyanese. So, and they were trying to encourage all this con- corruption to influence voting. So right, that, that, that feels very CIA, yeah. Right, right, okay. All so that the U.S. can ultimately help bring in a leader that's more moderate and more in line. And, and ultimately they did in the late, late 60s, but it was still a very questionable election, and it was still someone who was technically a Marxist, but it was like Marxism light. Um, so the so the US kind of like allowed it, but they still had a CIA presence down on Guyana, even though Guyana was still was at this point technically independent. So I find it interesting that while Jim Jones was shopping around for land that they could you know, where they could have their own refuge. He's going someplace that there's so much U.S. involvement. If he's trying to get away from the U.S., do you, you see what I'm saying? It's kind of, and I don't know if it was maybe, oh, it just made it, it was easier legally for him to do it that way. But uh, I, I don't know. Well, the, the, the take that the book has for the convenience of, of Guyana is that Guyana really just wanted Jonestown as a buffer between them and the and the neighboring country, which well, was well, uh, and, that's, and that's true because at in the seventies, in the early seventies, Venezuela, which is the border to the west and on the side close to Port Kaituma and Jones, I mean in Jonestown, they were trying to assert territorial claims. And at that point, the Guyanese government was starting to reach out to the U.S. and the CIA. So, right. it, it, you know, it's it's but it's this whole weird, I think, relationship going on there. And I'm not saying that Jones, like Jim Jones, was like CIA operative, which, OK, some people have gone down that rabbit hole and, you know, that conspiracy theory. Yeah, that seems and, a and saying, stretch. And saying that oh, it was really a body double that died that day because of, you know, multiple things that occurred during the autopsy and uh, stuff. I, You know, I don't believe that. But I think, because you brought up the issue of it, ex-cons working out, like working for Jones to some extent. That's not necessarily in and of itself a bad thing, but 
there could have been ex-cons that were still, yes, violent and had whatever ill intentions. And the Red Brigade was there. And I do think it's possible that the CIA could have helped man, you know, instill some people in the Red Brigade who was Jones, you know, like enforcing army within Jones. All right. I'm, I mean, potentially I just like that always felt like something that was going to self-destruct regardless. I think, I think that they maybe helped it along a little, but I think, it, yes, it was going to self-destruct too. Yeah. I mean, just because of Jones, I mean, Jones was just too, he was too loose a cannon. I mean, and I like I could see where the CIA would be like, look, if we can get somebody to take this son of a bitch out, that's going to make everybody's life a little bit easier. Well, I feel that by hiring someone like, OK, to be in that you could hire someone locally, it, it, you know, uh, someone from Guyana who is corrupt and will take whatever job, not necessarily bring in the actual CIA to do it, but doing it, you know, in lieu of. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and it was just the, f and some people have further said that, like gone down another conspiracy theory that, well, Senator Ryan had been, you know, was partly a target because like because by the CIA because he had been pushing amendment to get more transparency into FBI and CIA covert missions he wanted there to be like congressional uh, commissions to look you know and so some people have said that I don't think so I think that Lee Ryan being there was just that was it just Jones was going down that path anyway. And I think at that when it came down to it, the Red Brigade, they were there to help Jones carry out and facilitate speed things up. Because yes, when Ryan came there, that was that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I th th like sh the truth is always stranger than fiction, right? Like, like there sure, is, sure. there is a world in which that is a, a, a certain possibility. I feel like when it comes to Jonestown, that it really is an Occam's razor kind of thing. It's just, hey, this well-meaning dude went nuts on drugs and his own his own supply of bullshit and ended up murdering all these people as a result. Um, you know, it could be more complicated than that, but it also it also feels like that is is, is more than enough and and also elegantly simple in terms of murdering a thousand people you know no absolutely i mean and then of course there are people who say you know that mk ultra was part of this because of all the drugs um the drug aspect and such i i think that's you know i think that's a theory that makes sense with the manson family but not here yeah, that's a conversation for another day on the Manson family and MK, MK Ultra. But yeah, um, for sure. but there's actually more. There's more evidence for that to be a case than than here. But yeah, sure, that's a nice, easy thing to throw out there. But I really think, it, yeah, it was just you had someone that the drugs he was on certainly did not help the situation and they helped bring up any paranoia he already had. And I, I think that the CIA surveillance that had, that had been occurring was a legitimate thing, to, you know, concern, but it was the, I mean, that's what happened to the black Panthers, you know, aim and however many other groups, but you know, so I'm not saying there wasn't like there were some nuggets of truth, 
But he just started getting so much worse once he started the drugs. Yeah. And once he got down to Jonestown and he upped the drugs and he himself and he himself was isolated. That's just it. The isolation works negative against negatively against him, not just the followers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, like he got his own brand of cabin fever where, right? you know, like he was Jim Jones was used to like going to the movies once a week. They would go on vacation a couple of times a year. Like he as, as much of a crazy person as he was, uh, there was a relatively normal kind of family life at a, at a point in his life. And but, you know, the drugs started to take over and yeah. And as soon as you get to Jonestown, there's no there's no release. He never steps away from the bullshit. The old, that's all there is, is, right. is his never ending stream of bullshit that he's feeding to these people. Right. Because even when he was in the States, he was also traveling to other places to speak to other groups of people. You know, even if it was OK, I'm trying to recruit more people. <laughs> they were still different groups of people and yeah. in different locations. Uh, he still had to interact with the outside world to some extent. And you're right, cabin fever to some extent. Yeah, and, you know, once you're, like, catatonic on pills and, you know, the rest of your your team is constantly covering for you, like, he was making crazy decisions. And that's another reason that conspiracy uh, surrounding Jones himself is tough to sell because he was, he was such, he, he was zonked. Like he couldn't pull off any shit. Like getting these people to commit suicide mm -hmm. had been a practiced event. It wasn't like right. he, he was making decisions on the fly. He had decided to, it, it was always a question of when, not if, and, Yo. and, and the how was decided. So he just had to pull the trigger on it. And then everybody else took care of it. He just sat on the stage on his fat ass and gave his final sermon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and what was so, and with him and his actual death, um, you know, he was shot, but there is controversy of, yes, did he shoot himself? Did someone else shoot him? Um, because the gun was far enough away that, I mean, it could have either been thrown away in a, a recoil of shoot, you know, if he shot, but, or someone else could have just tossed it there after they shot him. They didn't, it, like, the forensics on this were, were difficult, and there was, like I started to say earlier, there was conflicting information there between Guyana and the U.S. Right, well, and... Part of the reason for that, too, let's let's get into this bit of foulness. Part of the problem, too, was that um, the body sat essentially overnight. And yeah, uh, by the time the, the Guyanese military showed up uh, and the book begins very dramatically with this moment where the Guyanese military are in the morning after uh, went before, before anyone knew it was a Jonestown massacre, um, he, the Guyanese military go in expecting to meet resistance from the gunmen they knew were in Jonestown. Right. So they were expecting a firefight and it's early in the morning. There's like mist coming off the jungle, uh, floor. And as they get into the compound, they realize that everyone there is dead and because of the heat uh the kinds of animals that are around there having yeah. those bodies sitting out overnight they, the way they yes. describe it was they were already in advanced states of decomposition even right. after a single day it, it was, was summer in yes Guyana even. summer in the jungle in the jungle <laughs> and there are plenty of Near bugs and animals to eat dead meat yeah and so it like when they originally were looking for bodies one of the, the problems with information coming out was originally they said the death toll was like 400 or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 
And that's because they hadn't peeled off that layer of bodies yet to realize that there were the bodies were bodies. stacked on top of each other. Right. Right. And, and, and there were plenty of bodies that they never identified because there were no like faces or fingerprints right. or none of that. Right. Right. Well, uh, and uh. yeah. And what, what gets me though is the, the U S government was then like, act, they were acting like the Guyanese government well, they don't know how to count. And their so their treatment of it was yeah. like they kind of put this narrative out there and you're like, motherfuckers. I mean, like, no, you're not pointing out they were stacked on top of each other and they were starting, you know, there were so many bodies to begin with. So even to count four hundred is quite a task. Yeah. Okay. But then to realize they are stacked on top of each other, they are all, all starting to decompose. Like they didn't say that. And and then you're like making this country look like they're incompetent. One thing I wanted to point out is that the medical examiner in Guyana actually tried to perform a hundred autopsies. The U.S. coroner, like, medical examiner was, like, not even 10. Wow. And, and I, you know, maybe it's, I don't know. I, I it, Like, I, that treatment is so, it, that, you know, it made, the U.S. gave out this narrative for so long that made the Guyana, you know, in their treatment of it, like, the Guyanese government, they're idiots. They don't know what they're doing. They mishandled all of this. It should have never happened. It was all Guyana's fault. Like that's in, and I think that was also part of why the U S government did play into mo much more of the suicide narrative to take away from any, it makes it seem we're, we're removing ourselves more. Yeah, Guyana, yeah, very quickly were like, we want no part of this. This was like, are, they, 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 these, these were Americans. Do, yeah, Th these, these were Americans doing American shit. Yes, they were here in Guyana, but uh, we didn't, we didn't see nothing. And obviously we have to clean up because these people, you know, in this country can't do anything right. I mean, that, you know, that's very yeah. much what it was. But I, I feel also like Yana was not like they weren't jockeying to take responsibility for oh, no. for for cleanup or any like the, the, all they wanted was for you know this mess to get cleaned up and for all this crazy American bullshit to go away. That well, Guyana that that Jonestown had suddenly become way more trouble than it was worth. Just as a PR, well, and then there was the well, maybe we can use this as a tourist thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which eh, leave it to a small country to be like, how can we capitalize on this tragedy? It's just, I mean, they, they found themselves in a situation that they didn't know how to handle. A hundred percent. Yes. And they were like, whoa, we bit off more than we could chew. And we thought we were doing something good, but, um, yeah. And, but, but then it went completely tits up. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it, it, right. Like, and that's the thing is that, you know, when, when people would make their visits to Jonestown and so forth, like people in the State Department and all that, they were kind of cursory visits. But it was always like, no, everything seems cool there. Like there wasn't there were rumors and and that kind of thing about Jonestown and, and People's mm -hmm. Temple. But there really wasn't a smoking gun of like, Hey, we got to get people out of here. It was really only the survivors yeah. that were, that were kind of banging that drum of like, no, you, you guys don't understand. He's way more dangerous than he seems yeah. on the surface. Yeah. yeah. And, and unfortunately they were right. And they just didn't, they didn't get the guy out of there in time, you know? But yeah, I, I do think the secret hero of it all was, was the dude in the San Francisco office who kept everyone alive. No, you mean Georgetown. Uh, or Georgetown, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Georgetown office. No, it was, uh, it, was, it was the two sons who were there for, like, to play with the basketball team. 
and right. they, they were and on they the phone, really, yeah. They really kept it down, like they kept that, like because who knows if there were people in California offices that would have followed suit. Yeah. Well, and, and, and some tried, so it was, you know, that, it, that was not crazy. Like Jim Jones had that much reach that, that people here in the good old U S of a were, were trying to kill themselves too. And as, as part of that revolutionary act, because again, this wasn't, Hey, they're coming for us. So we have to kill ourselves. This was, they're coming for us. So this is the weapon that we have against the establishment. Well, and it's just tragic when you hear like Jim Jones, Jim Jones Jr. For instance, talk about it. And he's like the whole tragedy of this thing. I mean, he's like, obviously the amount of lives lost, but that so many people really did have this dream and did want to try for a better world. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and he's like, and we were genuinely trying and then, but you know, he, he, it's just when you hear Jim Jones in the, final tape and he's talking about how senator ryan w- has been shot and killed at the airstrip already he says he puts the blame on someone else he distances himself from it like this wasn't something that he ordered or was okay with yeah. he's yeah. totally okay with it you know and here Jim Jones was so much trying to distance himself from, you know, from responsibility and both, you know, Jim Jr. and Stephen Jones, they're both like, you know, they both saw that in their father at their time at that time. And they were just struggling and trying to figure out how to continue to do something good or how to break away. And they didn't, you know, they saw their father was fucking things up. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, right. But how do you, how do you kind of, but how do you make a difference? Like they were, e- they even yeah. tried to speak to him about it and they were ignored. Oh, sure. Yeah. He didn't give a shit about that. I, I mean, you can, at that point, what whatever love a family he had was gone. He was, yeah. He was a messiah, you know, he was above family. Well, and it's not like, I mean, he was so, I mean, he preached gender equality too. And he rarely, he rarely, you know, treated right. that. Yeah. He did but, awful things he to really, women. Yeah. He really didn't listen to his wife, Marceline, you know, cause she even tried to talk him out of some things. Yeah. She's the, the one who's crying when he's doing the mother, mother, not. Yeah, you know, like, uh, cause, yeah, because at that when when the the mass suicides going down, she was not cool with any of that. Like Marceline Jones did not. That's not what she signed up for. Well, she, she didn't up. want, particularly the killing of the kids. Yeah, like she, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. part of what got her so much. Like, was we're also killing we're killing these children too? Like what? Like so. At the risk of stepping on a transition. Yeah. Um, the One of the things about the movie The Sacrament. And I was going to say, let's let's go ahead and transition to uh, the movie. So in the, the Sacrament is kind of a found footage movie from Ty West that is sort of a, a fictionalized account of like what would it have been like to be a fly on the wall in the last day of Jonestown is, is sort of, that would be the white paper of here's what this movie is about. Right. Um, and I think one of the, you know, we, we already touched on this briefly. You did, uh, that one of the problems with the movie is that it, it fails to kind of capture the scope of Jonestown like and the, the, how long, this sort of grooming had been going on. And so when you're watching the movie, it kind of feels a little like 
you know, it is sort of a horror movie. So it, it does feel like, oh, these are just creepy bad guy cult people as opposed to um, these are people who wanted to do the right thing and have been with this guy for years. And over time they have become kooky, but they didn't start that way. And, you know, it's, you, there's just no time in a movie that's 90 minutes long to do that kind of legwork for all these characters. And as a result, I think the, the impact of the movie is lessened. It feels, it feels yeah. like a movie instead of like the, the truth is so much more gruesome and horrifying and, you know, seductive and all that stuff. And it, and I, it, when I watch the sacrament, I, I can't help but feel like it, it's like a, a cliff's notes that also gets the scale wrong, you know, like it's a tale of one city instead of a tale of two cities, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and it feels a little hollow to me as a result. Yeah. I kind of had, had a similar, this was, I had never seen the sacrament before, uh, before it was chosen for this. And yeah, it, it kind of had the feeling that if you ask somebody, that heard about what happened at Jonestown and then hadn't thought about it in a long time. It's like, tell me what happened. And this, this could have been the story that plus, you know, trying to avoid having to pay somebody for their likeness rights. Yeah, that's true. But you know, part of my problem too, with, and, and you're absolutely right though, that if this feels a little hollow, but part of my problem is that, the actor cast as father, whose last name is I, Jones, whose last name is also Jones. Uh-huh. He First doesn't, name James. he doesn't, he doesn't come across as nearly charismatic enough to be a Jones, a true Jones figure like Jim Jones. And yeah. I think even if you're going to go the route that they went in this, they needed to have someone in that role who could present a certain amount more of the frenzied charisma and 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 just the energy. Yeah, I, I think he makes a good old Jim Jones, but the problem with that is you don't get to see why everybody was on board in the first place. You know? Yeah. Um I, I, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, it's, it's weird. Um, he, cause he, he looks kind of like Jim Jones and, and maybe that's just the, the sunglasses talking. It's uh, vaguely. Yeah. I, the sunglasses does a lot of work for, uh, for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's not the kind of like boot stomp and musical kind of thing. He just, he's an old dude who sits down and kind of, pontificates and uh yeah it, it, i think it kind of loses a little bit of something um because of that because it's hard to it's hard to sit down with him and and feel like I, you know the uh after the interview in the movie you know there's that moment where the interviewer is like i don't know it's just like i couldn't I, I was off my balance. I didn't ask him the half the questions I wanted to and that kind of thing. And you don't really get the, the sense of that when it's happening. Yeah. It, it really requires him to kind of tell you like the movie has to stop and be like, Oh, he was kind of seduced by him because he's so charismatic as opposed to him just being really charismatic. So yeah, I think you're yeah. right with that. Yeah. I, I think that would have helped some because it would have made more sense when, it, right, you know, like in the, that particular element of saying, yeah, we get that he was seduced by a certain charisma too. You know what I mean? But he just, he's a little too toned down. Yeah. Yeah. A little, a little too pilled up. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, that's a bummer. I think you're right. Uh, and it, it feels like we're just, you know, dunking on the sacrament a little bit. And I suppose we probably are. Uh, <laughs> it was better than I expected. I will say that. Uh, <laughs> I will say it, it's, it's not a bad movie is the thing. No. Yeah. In, 
and truthfully, like I like I mentioned earlier, um, this was my second time watching it, and I think I appreciated it more this time. You know, I think I think it was better on the second viewing, but it's still yes, hollow. <laughs> yeah, I mean bit. it. It's fun if if you can say such a thing again about a Jonestown film, but it's. You know, it's tense and, the, and you know, the, the runs through the jungle and everything are, are kind of fascinating. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the biggest problem with all of it is that if you know the real story, this feels so much smaller. Yeah. And and the movie ought to feel at least as big as the event it's based on. But like when you see the big revival meeting and, and that kind of thing and it's, you know, 150 people maybe and you're like well okay i mean that's a about a tenth of jonestown and and so when you see the body scattered around and and everything that too was one of those things of like this just can't capture even a tenth of how horrific that was yeah I, i i know and that's that's another thing is that uh it's if you're going to do something as closely inspired to like it's obviously to you know inspired yeah. by Jonestown Th- yeah this is absolutely you, not Jonestown right you <laughs> got to go to the full volume of people um to really genuinely capture the true horror because i mean and not to say that this doesn't have an element of genuine horror because it still does there's still some things that are effective in the sac in the movie the sacrament but to truly feel it in the sense of jonestown you got to go bigger and i in in the uh looking slightly into the the movie i saw that it was shot in sequential order so that my there was a initial little bit of a gripe was they don't even have money for squibs when people are getting shot. It's just, you know, like shooting off a cap gun and people just falling over. No squibs, no uh, CGI blood or anything. But then mm-hmm. they do stuff like that fire stunt that I'm pretty sure actually yeah. happened. And they yeah. do have blood that they use later. But, you know, my initial thought was, oh, they blew all their their budget on those couple scenes. And then they just had to... <laughs> Add some more, but they didn't have any money for anything besides whatever you put in a gun to make it make, I guess, may, they probably used blanks or maybe right. something better since it was a Eli Roth, Ty West joint. Um, oh, yeah. I Seeing Eli Roth presents on the front end of this is like, oh, that ain't helping anything. <laughs> well, no, no. That I expected never... him to pop out of the jungle with Dr. Mambo. Like, hey guys! <laughs> but hey, no, he didn't. How do about that. I take you on a history of horror? <laughs> Check out my you... Lucio Fulci shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! But um, yeah, it's. I, well, and and one thing to say is that they did build. All that entire set, okay, from scratch. Um, and in I'm the told middle, it was visually similar to Jonestown. Yeah, it is, but and that's in um, but they built it in Georgia. And as soon as I saw the trees, like where they're driving from the airstrip, I'm like, that's the South. <laughs> like I recognize, and they just had a few like tropical like limbs like stuck here and there to make it look more like the jungle. But no, if you look at the bark on the trees, I'm like, Oh no, (laughs) I grew up around those trees in Alabama. I know what that is. Um, And if you've ever watched a lot of the walking dead, you'll recognize that kind of forest. Uh Um, It's a forest. It's not a jungle. Um, But I, you know, I appreciated that they were trying, <laughs> but you're right, Darren. They they really didn't have a big budget. 
But yeah, I mean, they. Yeah. Th- I was a little surprised because I also am super picky with found footage movies. I, I, I like way, Agreed. way less than, or I dislike quite a lot more than I like. And this is more up my street with the, well, they're reporters. That's why they've always got their cameras. That's why the guy yeah. went back for the camera, even though, you know, and stuff like that. That That's always a big thing for me. And I, I almost came out of it for a second when, uh, Gene Gene Jones as what Father Charles Anderson Reed I think that was his full name, which I was looking for some sort of reference in the initials or anything like that. But when he did that sort of Biff Tannen moment, where he's like, "It's not, mm-hmm. it's not the quantity of your life; it's the amount of value that you." And he goes on like a five paragraph long thing for the word quantity. Or quality, <laughs> it's it. Uh, I don't know. It might have just been me doing that, but Get, I, getting the uh, the beef tannin by the wall of it, the, <laughs> like a screen door on a battleship. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, it, you know, it, it even the the dialogue, which is like we talked about, kind of a pastiche to the original Jim Jones stuff. Um, I, again, it kind of, you know, I, I'm looking at this through the lens of somebody that knows this story really thoroughly and had been really immersed in it. Mm-hmm. And so seeing the, the, the reduction of the size and, and scope of it, and also the complete lack of context. So when you have a yeah. scene like Amy Siemens setting herself on fire like you don't have the understanding that like, oh, there's probably a scene that we'll never see of him cleaning her up and and helping her get her life in order and shit like that. And so it's just she's just perpetually a villain and crazy person as opposed to it, it removes the humanity from the people who Jim Jones convinced to kill themselves, you know? Uh, and that's that's kind of frustrating, I think. Well, it makes the Jonestown massacre look more like a suicide than an actual murder. It, you know what I yes. mean? Yes, yes. They're, they're all kind of crazy. Yeah. Right. Oh, these are just mindless zombies who will do whatever. It, I mean, it does show that, yes, some people had guns held to them and a few people were shot, but it doesn't show like the people who were forcibly injected um, because there were, you know, broken and bent needles found, you know, all around the place. People who were injected. And like I said earlier, people who were injected in places where they couldn't have done it to themselves. Uh, yeah. 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 For sure. So it's, you know, it, this movie just doesn't even bring up the, the like much of a an issue of, well, no, that kind of no, this is a mass murder rather than a mass suicide. It just lays it purely as on face value of no, this is you know mass suicide. Yeah, these people all did it willingly. No, your footage that you even shot clearly shows. They didn't all do it willingly. So your narrative is false. But again, I'm splitting hairs. <laughs> right. And it's a 90 minute movie. And how do you make this, you know, compelling to a viewer who isn't intimately familiar with Jonestown? Um, but I think that's the big mistake of the movie is like, just make a Jonestown movie. Don't, uh-huh. don't screw around and do this fictionalized version that, isn't as as good as as jonestown and instead uh you know go whole hog like do do make the character jim jones and if you got to secure some rights then maybe that's that's what you do um so i don't know It, it it's it is frustrating to me uh to watch 
this movie. And I, I agree with you. I, I think I liked it more this time than I did the first time I saw it. But in both cases, I, I just keep coming away from it, shaking my head like this is close to the movie I want it to be. Yeah. But but it's it's not there. And I like Ty West. Yeah. As yeah, a, me too. You know, yeah. as a general note, I like Ty West. Um, I think, you know, I think that some of this is, you know, well written, but it's just, uh, it, it doesn't deliver what I want. And it's not that I, and I, and I know you talked about, you mentioned how it was marketed. Yeah, it, I guess made it seem like it was going to be more Jonestown than it was. I don't remember the marketing for this. They actively push back when people suggested that this was kind of a thinly veiled Jonestown movie. The well, they really push back on that and were like, "No, no, it's really not." It's, it was. It's- it was funny because they initially were acting like that, and then a lot of people, you know, said, "Oh, it's very thinly veiled." And then they were like, "Oh, no, no, it's not." <laughs> like that was what was so weird about it is that rather than fully embrace it and say we were inspired by even you know and just and leave it be at that it was like they initially started to but then went back at least that's how i remember it i I wonder yeah i that feels right and it it felt very messy and they weren't they weren't weren't, sure how to market it almost right because if you say that it's based on jonestown and then you see it then you have our reaction which is like, well, that it's kind of Jonestown, but way smaller and less interesting. Well, and and I think you can say it was inspired by that, but it's not the full story. Right, right. Then you have clearly established to the public so that they're coming there and the people like us who knew more of the details of Jonestown are not coming away and saying, that wasn't Jonestown, I'm disappointed, okay? And then, you know, then the people who don't know much about Jonestown, maybe they see this and then they're like, oh, I want to learn more. I don't know, you know, or they're are you not getting the people who might be turned off that it's going to be so Jonestown, you know, they're only like getting a portion, you know, they're not getting as much of the story. Yeah, yeah. I yeah I I agree with that I think that yeah I I, I, I mean, think that it, figure out what the fuck you're doing <laughs> right I mean ju- like you said just say hey this is this is a fly in the wall what would it be like to to be there on the day of of Jonestown with the understanding this is a a fictionalized version of it it is you know but I, again how do you say that it, via marketing in a clean way I guess is the other problem. Right. Um, so, eh, eh, uh, at any rate, like, and again, it's not a bad movie. It's just, it, it feels so, uh, so reduced. It's it's so minimalized compared to the, the actual story of Jonestown. And it, it, that's the biggest problem is it just feels very unsatisfying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so would you recommend the movie? Mm. Mm. I Oh, that's a tough one. I think if you're interested in the story of Jonestown, there are better sources for that. I think there are better documentaries. Uh, and there was an ABC one that that's not bad. Um, yeah. I, I don't think I would recommend the sacrament. Actually. I, w- I would probably say, if you're if what you're looking for is the story of Jonestown, it is better presented in multiple places, uh, and and there are other things worth your time. Darren, yeah, pretty much that, and with the slight, if you are relatively knowledgeable about Jonestown and want to see some references to it in a found footage movie. So that's a whole lot of if, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I would tell anybody to pay for it. Like I, I would say if it pops up on a thing you got and you want to, yeah, a back of the box 
plus the marketing. Yeah. <laughs> you know I feel what? like <laughs> I won't. I will not re- I will not really recommend it. I think I'm giving it more points because it's a found footage movie that I didn't think sucked. Yeah. Yeah. I um yeah, I I know. It's well I know. I have to I have to give it the big like uh, it, if I if, don't if 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 <laughs> it's not a straight yeah. up yes. Yeah, that's just it is that if you want to see the story of Jonestown like the legit story of Jonestown, you're better off going for documentaries. Um, you know, you'll get more details and especially the ones that have included interviews with survivors. I think those are, it's very impactful to tell, to know the full story of Jonestown and people's temple because people's Jonestown is people's temple is more than just Jonestown. Okay. And I think, that story needs to be told. So that's why I can't fully, I can't completely recommend The Sacrament. If you want to see a movie that's just inspired by Jonestown type thing, and if you, you know, again, I don't know, if you just like watching movies with cult type stuff in them, you know, <laughs> go on. Go ahead maybe throw on the sacrament, but it's not even the best one. That's like about a cult. Yeah. You know? Um, so I can't give it a, I can't give it a high, a high recommend at all, but definitely I, in the context of talking about a Jonestown movie, I'd say, yeah, go for a documentary first. Um, but I did, like I said, I did, Fine. I did appreciate the sacrament more watching it the second time um, because I, I think I just was like, I'm not holding it to be the gospel of Jonestown. <laughs> that's, see, that's really part of it. Yeah. 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 It's right. Um, yeah. It's a bummer. I, I wish, uh, and I know, wanted to, I know I wanted it to be better. That's what sucks. Some, someday, uh, and it may happen, uh, very soon. Um, there is going to be one of those like, Hey, this is a four part eight hour docu series about Jonestown. That is going to be the, you know, the final word on it kind of thing. Just an incredible piece of, of, uh, entertainment. Uh, the OJ doc version of the Jonestown story. Yeah. And, and that will be, I will be deliriously happy to watch that. Oh no, me too. Yeah. Give me a limited series on like HBO or something. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, all, you know, I, I think I know you and I did at uh, Darren. Were, did you listen to the audiobook on this as well? Yes. Yeah, I thought the audiobook was great. If you're looking for, it's not a documentary. It, it won't do nothing to your eyeballs. But if you're listening to this, uh, you like hearing stuff, and the audiobook's great. Well, and I was going to ask if people, if you, if you would recommend the book. Um, easily, I would easily recommend the book. Yeah, the the but, book is fantastic. I thought. Absolutely. I mean, and there there are other books of Jonestown out there, um, which I do have uh, another one that I, I want to read. But this I had heard a lot of good things about. And I did do the audiobook, And, it, you know, it's a, a good audiobook as far as the narration, too. Um, you know, that's always something to note. But it's... Uh, it's. I feel like it's. It's a very comprehensive breakdown of Jim Jones and the People's Temple. Um, it's like like we've been saying. It's that this is all more. People's Temple is about more than just Jonestown. Yeah. And that's what people really need to see. And. 
I think also to go back and open the narrative of and truly understand why this was not mass suicide. This was a mass murder. And even the ones who were there who quote unquote willingly drank the flavor aid with the cyanide, they had been so brainwashed at that point that really what free will did many of them have, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. They that, still that... were doing it at the behest of Jim Jones. Yeah. So that's, that's the same thing in my opinion. Well, yeah, I think the book really helps with the whole, no one knows that they're joining a cult when they join it really uh, with some, right, some exceptions. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's one yeah, of the things uh, that I walked away with. For sure. I mean, I, the book, yeah. I, I think, does a just an outstanding job of placing all of that stuff in a very understandable kind of context. And, um, you know, not, not that you're like, hey, I want to join a cult now. But <laughs> it's like, oh, I can see how this turned into a cult and how that that people who you know, just turned around, like looked around one day and we're like, Oh fuck, I'm in a cult. I didn't. Yeah. That, yeah. I didn't know. When did that happen? Yeah. And if you're really interested in the subject of Jonestown, I do also recommend going to the Jonestown Institute website. Yeah, for sure. Um, also all the alternative considerations of Jonestown. It's a kind of this, historical archive of Jonestown and has a lot of information. It, it's like mem remembrance of the victims and the survivors, but it has um, people who are survivors, like their accounts of things, good and bad times, um, you know, and there are also some, documents that have been released over the years about the investigations that occurred into, you know, that went into Jonestown, but also goes into like, well, this is what the church's official view, you know, people's temple, their official view was on such and such and such and such. And it's, it's very interesting and it's got a lot of pictures. Um, oh, I like that. Yeah. Uh, like from the historical archives, uh, but it's it's hard when there like there's a page that is a list of all the dead from Jonestown and you just start looking at the page and you're like, oh my god. Like it's just wow. Yeah. It yeah, it's it's overwhelming. Mm. Yeah, it's it's one of the most tragic and and fascinating stories and all of you know sort of murder history and jim jones is he's an amazing figure and he's complicated and oh and yeah incredibly uh, uh like you know he's intriguing as a figure even without his personal charm and charisma like he he his life was really interesting and there are so many there are so many ways things could have gone differently for him. Um, he could have but, just stayed a monkey salesman. It, it, well, he was always like, if he had gotten into <laughs> politics, I think like if that ambition had worked out for him, then I think that it, it would have been different. Like he still would have been a bit of a demagogue, I think, but it just, it, it, but the drugs changed all of that. Like it was, oh, it, yeah. At the end of the day, the the story of Jonestown is a, as much a cautionary tale about drugs as anything. I, I really, I don't put all the blame on the drugs, of course, but that really was a major factor in his downfall. Yes, it yes, sped things up. It really, yeah. It yeah, it put a spin on as soon as like all that paranoia and it, stuff set in. It, it was fed his uh, the paranoia that was already there. Yeah, and it did legitimately you know cause health problems too. But um, it, it fed the paranoia that was already there, and then he just kept 
upping the dosage of the pills. And it just kept feeding. You know, it's a vicious cycle. Right, right. You know, it turns out the more pills you you take, the more you want them. Yeah. And yeah, and, and so there's just no telling, like, what a what kind of crazy shit was going on above above his shoulders by the end you know he was just he was out of his fucking gourd uh on pills all the time right so yeah you know it's yeah it's it's tough it, it's really tough to know how much of jonestown would have would have happened had the drugs just not been there at all you know right um, right so yeah like you i mean they, like that doesn't excuse Jim Jones by any stretch, but th- I, there's just no question in my mind that just so much of it was pills. <laughs> it so did not help. <laughs> yeah, it, it's great. That, I mean, look, I love coming on this show to talk about the craziest people that the earth has produced. <laughs> and Jim Jones is way up there in terms of a guy who could have done so much good had he used his his powers for for good instead of evil if he had gone with the light side of the force and instead he is he's one of history's greatest monsters like he he personally uh, can be tied to the death of almost a thousand people that's just hard to think about yeah right but all, also it's amazing it, uh, it's charisma again yeah yeah it's a hell of a thing yeah anyway yeah that's why my cult's never taken off (laughs) (laughs) you're plenty charismatic bro i mean that's what you you say to somebody who doesn't have a good cult (laughs) no no monkey i mean i i it's the pills i got i got started on the pills and and i got ahead of myself (laughs) <laughs> should I should have waited to get the cult before the pills. <laughs> oh. Well, is there anything else we want to say about Jonestown? Oh, I think I might be spent. I think I may have. I, this was really good, though, because I, I feel like I purged. I've been living with all this Jonestown information and yeah. and and. and you you know you can't sit around that's how you get cancer is sit around with jonestown information with nobody to tell it to uh me uh, too i've been like jonestown 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 yeah i i told a poor guy i work with about how they found the body stacked up like that and he was like <laughs> why the fuck are you telling me that and i was like it was <laughs> is it that horrifying and he was like yes <laughs> why are you telling me right. that is this because is not... you didn't know about it before i told you that's why Right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yes, it was. <laughs> um, I it, it was good to get all of this out, uh, out in the open, <laughs> out in the sunlight where we can we can talk about it and see it. Um, yeah, it's it, it's a real it, it's an amazing story. And and for those people who are listening to this and yes, and want to go further down the rabbit hole that, you know, road to Jonestown is amazing. Great docs. You, it, there are so many pieces of this story that are fascinating. So, uh, don't, don't be shy. There's good stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true. That's true. Darren, you have anything else to say? No, no. I think we were pretty extensive. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i know i again I, I you're right Bo. i had to i had to get it out of my system i've been i've had so much of it on my brain and i'm like okay jones down yeah finally talk about it i needed to but i'm sure i'll go down another rabbit hole about it soon <laughs> it, yeah it's only a, that's the thing only a matter of time before uh, i return to jones town yes in a sense yes so well Bo, it's great having you on um what else do you have going on outside of this right now uh, uh no um no nah, i uh i'm always doing shit um so uh, what do i have going on right now there's hero hero go show we're continuing a, a series on the i movies that are uh, kind of hong kong horror uh, on that asian horror uh podcast um 
Then uh, what else am I doing? There is uh, uh, Pick Six Movies, which just dropped an episode on Spice World as we look at terrible movies uh, <laughs> where where they try to thrust a musician and or band into a movie. And, and it just worked out badly for everybody. And uh, then there's Duncan and Bo Come Correct. We are looking at the Canadian horror television series uh, Slasher. And that has been a really good time. Um, so, yeah, a lot of that stuff, uh, as well as just legionpodcasts.com in general, you're going to find all kinds of shows where we've got original stuff over on YouTube, as well as uh, kind of video forms of the podcast. So, um, you know, we're everything, we're everywhere and we do everything. Uh, and, and it's a lot, it's a lot of fun. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> Yes, our, our not so dark or overlord that you are. Yes, you're always uh, yeah, around. I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not too terrible an overlord as those things go. Yeah, it's an acceptable amount. <laughs> right. That, well, that's what you want, right? Is you want, yeah, you want a little bit of authority, but not so much that you start going crazy and moving everybody to Guyana. <laughs> that's where, that's where the problems start. Yeah, we're not going to the middle of the jungle. Yeah. Yet, yet at least. Yet. Right. Right. You know, give it time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, we're 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 a ways away from that. Yeah. <laughs> Soon. Okay. Soon. Okay, Bo, I'm going to let you go. And then Darren and I will take a quick break before we end the show. Okay. All right. Thanks. Shall we turn? Always okay. fun. Thank you. thank you, Bo. Yeah, thank you. I feel I I feel like I have been cleansed. <laughs> Can you feel the power? Yeah, I, I I love it. I love it. That was so much fun. Uh, thank you again. I, I I already look forward to next March. Yeah, we've got to figure out something good. Yeah, it'll. I, come. You know, we'll get there. We'll figure something out. We got a. You know, the clock's ticking though. 364 days to go till next March Madness. That's right. That's the way I look at this. I know. Trust me, I'm already thinking about it. Excellent. Broadcasting from the Cursed Earth, the Psycho Semantic Ast. Let us face without panic the reality of our time. The fact that atom bombs may someday be dropped on our cities. And let us prepare for survival by understanding the weapon that threatens us. To have a... Uh an ignorant, uh, thin-skinned megalomaniac uh, who sends off the uh, you know, quitters at 3 a.m. if somebody angered him. The neo-Nazis turning up in Washington, D.C. to have a rally saying, Heil Trump. We talk about politics. I knew I couldn't trust you corporate greaseballs. We talk about movies. You can't come down here and arrest people just because of what they look like. Are you crazy? Oh, oh, oh. But that's police harassment. We talk about political movies. We're in trouble. The whole world's in trouble. They're all around us and you never knew them. You can only see them with these special glasses. The Psycho Semanticast. And we are back. So, um, yeah, that was a fun discussion, if <laughs> fun is the right word. Um, it's always interesting discussions we have, at least uh, during our March Madness episodes. That's for sure. But, um, anyway, so... Darren, why don't you tell us what we're going to be doing in April for our next episode? All right. So in April, we will be doing the People vs. Larry Flint movie. Um, I don't know if we need to justify why we were doing it <laughs> or not, but that is what we have chosen. Yeah. We did well, just we... die. He did just die. We had been th we had thought about it beforehand, but he did just um, die. So, yeah, it's kind of popped back into our heads. So, yeah, he just died. Uh, also, presently, and I'm sure next month there will still be a lot of people not understanding what the word censorship actually means. Uh, <laughs> Isn't that always a conversation? That's just I don't know. It's just ongoing. Yeah. So yeah, lots lots of 
It should be. It's, like you said, it's something that we've talked about doing for some time, but it's never right. Like, well, we have to do it. When's the perfect? This is the time. Um, and trust me, because I lived in Cincinnati and he was being persecuted while I was living there. I have some shit to say. <laughs> and uh, growing up, well, my my current and still best friend, uh, his dad drew for Larry Flint Publications my entire childhood. And I think before we were born and up to not very long ago. <laughs> He drew okay. cartoons for so many of his magazines. So, I mean, Larry Flint would, yeah. Anyway, I have some stuff to add as well. Okay. This will be interesting then. Yeah. So. At least I, uh, at least sounds we'll like enjoy it. it could be. Yeah, at least we'll enjoy it. <laughs> Hopefully other people will as well. So, Yeah. People versus Larry Flint, it, uh, the Milo Foreman movie starring Woody Harrelson and Courtney Love. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. So, yeah, that'll so, be our Easter episode or whatever you want to call it. Our <laughs> April episode. April. Um, so, yeah, Darren, what do you have going on uh, outside of VD Clinic? Oh, uh, let's see. Well, over at Psychosemantic, I think by the time this comes out, because uh, this should be out sometime in March, uh, we are getting closer to the 100th episode. I have no idea what to do with that. Uh, and sometime, uh, I, I'm not sure what regular episode will be next, but... The episode on sneakers should be out around the time. Look for it when, if you're hearing this, you're, if you're hearing me talking. That's the last episode I know of that should be out. And yeah, just dealing with springtime <laughs> and shit. How about you? Uh, no, I have nothing else going on besides this at the moment. <laughs> but, yeah, that's fine. Just, I've been just doing uh, a a book and movie club through work, um, through our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. So I've had <laughs> quite a bit that I've been handling over there outside of all of this. But, Yeah. So, yeah, thank thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, as per usual, VD Clinic Pod in uh, most of the social me media network areas. Uh, what, what word am I looking for? The uh, handle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or at Gmail and our Facebook page and, you know, yeah, Twitter, Instagram, those fun places. I think Flick Chat is angled mostly towards sports stuff now, but I mm -hmm. think we still have something over there. <laughs> but anyway, you know how it goes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for listening, and um, I hope to have you back another time. Thank you. Bye. Don't drink the flavoring. Don't drink the flavor aid. Thank you for listening to another episode of the VD Clinic. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at Twitter at VD Clinic Pod or reach us via email at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook group, VD Clinic Podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback suggestions, and more.